Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us on the third panel session of the discussion on WHO Western Pacific Region uh, First Annual Health Innovation Forum. Um, in this session, we're looking at can success be replicated and how do we institutionalize uh, innovation and actually evaluate that institutionalization. Uh, my name is Nima Asghari. I am director of the Asia Pacific Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Um, APO is a partnership of countries, academic institutions, uh, development banks, and WHO Western Pacific region and Southeast Asia regions. Um, and we aim to develop the evidence needed for health policy makers uh, to help with evidence-informed decision-making, focusing primarily on, on Asia and the Pacific region and trying to generate and gather that evidence from the Asia Pacific. Um, if it's okay, uh, I would like to start with giving a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, please, if it's possible, uh, Thank you. Uh, I would be grateful if you could use your, uh, your name when you're logging in as an attendee or you change it so that we can see who you are and please refrain from marketing of products or services. Um, there will be a questions and answer session as with, with other panel sessions uh, in this series and it will be towards the end. Um, and we are looking at roughly 12 minutes per panel discussions. Uh, if you go to next slide, please. Uh, the journey itself is really, this panel discussion is a journey. It's a journey of innovations from piloting uh, and scaling up to finding opportunities to push the agenda forward, to working on a wholesale change in the system, and also finally evaluating that process. Um, we're gonna start this with uh, a video and a presentation by Mr. Uh, Lu Mai. He is the vice chairman of the China Development uh, Research Foundation. And he's going to look at the nutrition as an example of, of initiating and scaling up. We'll then move to Ms. Sejal Mistry, who is the country director for Access Health International. And she's going to bring up the what we would, I would call, I guess, the elephant in the room, which is the COVID, and see how we can use a innovations and, and opportunities um, and use the COVID as an example of how we can actually improve collaboration uh, between different sectors and that, that can be moved forward to the whole of the health system. We will then continue with Dr. Mario Villaverde, uh, Mario is the Under Secretary of Health uh, at the Philippines Department of Health. Um, as many of you may know, uh, last year and this year, the Philippines has been uh, doing a huge program of uh, implementing the new UHC bill. And Mario is going to be talking about um, the challenges and the innovative approaches in trying to implement some of those, or overcome some of those challenges and bottlenecks. And then we'll go to Professor David Stockler, who is a professor of policy analysis and public management in the Bocconi University in Milan. And he's going to talk about evaluating these innovations and also using innovative approaches when it comes to evaluation itself. Um, we'll wrap up with uh, Dr. Martin Taylor, who is the director of the Division of Health Systems and Services. And he's gonna be acting as a discussant, bringing out some of those issues um, we'll then go to Q's and A's, and at the end, uh, as with other panel discussions, uh, we will have uh, summarizing the session using graphics, which will be done by two uh, graphic artists, Ms. Amy and Ms. Yona, uh, Ms. Ms. Yana, who will try to summarize the uh, pertinent points. So with that, I would like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Lumai, if he could start with his presentation, um, and uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nima, for your uh, uh, kindly introduction. And uh, my name is Rumai. I come from China Development Research Foundation. 
which is a non-profit organization affiliated with the government think tank. Our mission is to advance the good governance and the policy to promote economic and social development in China. So to, uh, uh, to do so, we organize a conference, uh, one if China Development Forum, uh, joined by CEO and chairman of multinational company, scholar, and uh, Chinese government official. We also do the research and the training and the social experiment. And today I would like to say something about the nutrition improvement in rural area. It's uh, starting the, from uh, our research project. Uh, we did that with uh, UNDP. Uh, that's a China Human Development Report 2005. The issue, the subject is uh, equity. So we analyzed the equity by the subject and by the area. We talk about the inequality in income, wealth, education, uh, and the public health, and extra. And the, this report won award from a UNDP 2007 about the, uh, the policy influence. So we see the uh, very fast uh, uh, growth of the uh, income per capita. But meanwhile, we see the, uh, the gap between the rich and the poor is expanded uh, very quickly. So Gini coefficient in China uh, now is uh, 0 0.46. It's uh, quite high. How to improve this? We give a suggestion to the government in that report. Uh, it's 10 suggestions. But we believe we are not uh, only uh, talking. We need to do something. So we started uh, the one suggestion we give to such a uh, government is about the nutrition in rural area uh, with the children. So. We started uh, to do some uh, survey. Also, we know this is a problem, but we're still surprised uh, by what we see. The students in the rural compulsory, uh, in, in rural school, uh, boarding school, uh, bring the food and uh, there's no kitchen. There's just uh, some stove for them to burn the uh, rice and the soybean. So, the students in the 13 years in those area, a uh, rural area, you can see it's only equalized the 10 years of the uh, rural, ever, uh, the, the urban uh, children. So that's uh, three years behind of their, their height. So we decided we should start uh, the experiment we took uh, two counties uh, as a uh, size, and uh, we financed uh, 2,000 students for their school meal, build up kitchen, and uh, provide a hot meal. And uh, for another five stud 500 students, they receive uh, clothes and uh, shoes. So one year after, we got the result. But please uh, show the video. video. Wu Yufen's parents left home years ago to find work, leaving behind only her elderly grandmother and her younger sisters. Every morning, she walks through the chilly fields to gather food and prepare breakfast. The sisters skillfully tend to the stove, quickly stir-frying what they have gathered. Without oil or meat, they complete their meal with leftover pickles. This meager meal is their only source of energy for the entire morning. Mr. Wu, the school's only male teacher, starts his day even earlier. The introduction of the Nutrition Improvement Plan has seen Mr. Wu add another duty to his already busy day. Now, he must also source the ingredients for the school meals. 
被那只苍蝇啊蚊子啊把它上面了。你看到学校来，我们不说现在能吃的多好吗？最起码他能怎样？吃饱吃的很开心，是吧？每天都能有什么呀？啊，两菜一荤一汤。我看起学生吃来是挺挺开心的。In the steamy kitchen, the cooks are busy preparing meals. They make many different dishes with seasonal vegetables, fresh meat, eggs, tofu, even chili. They hope that by making the meals tasty, that the children will be encouraged to eat more. Research from the China Development Research Foundation (CDRF) shows the nutrition improvement plan has greatly improved the children's development, both mentally and physically. Data published. On the CDRF School Nutrition Improvement Initiative website, shows that in some areas the children's nutritional intake is still somewhat below the national standards. There is still more work to be done to protect our children's future. School meals improve not only the children's well-being today, but they also lay a strong foundation for their healthy growth in the future. Today. The children eat a little better. Tomorrow, they will live and learn a little better, and over time, our society as a whole will benefit. I think、uh, you will notify notify the two things. One is that. Children hold a very big bowl and they eat all of them up. And the second about their smiling face, we like that. And after the experiment, the central government took the decision, the 2011. And now the government project cover the 1,700 counties. Totally, school is 100. Five, fifty thousand school.、Uh, the students is thirty-two、uh, million students. Every year, government spend one point nine billion, uh, nineteen billion RMB, uh, for the subsidy. The result is very encouraging. Uh, two thousand seventeen, we have an assessment about the program. The Uh, health check data come from a、uh, six two counties, one point nine million student. You can see when they re,、uh, the red line is the two thousand sixteen, and the black line、uh, is the two thousand twelve, and the, the red line is the、uh, national wide. So when the、uh, they are seven years old enrolled in the school. The height is almost the same, 2016 compared with 2012. But because this nutrition improvement program, when they are 11 years old, 2016, you can see the big difference, five centimeters between these two. So it's close to the national wide, and this is a very significant improvement. Uh, so after government uh, take this uh, de uh, de decision, we can see the program uh, implement uh, in the poverty area, remote area, very difficult to monitoring and、uh, to guide. So we set up a, a website and、uh, helped by Microsoft to monitoring uh, those uh, schools uh, nutrition uh, situation and.、Uh, A teacher send us、uh, every day by their uh, mobile uh, mobile phone、uh, several picture on the form, and uh, from uh, Beijing we can analyze、uh, every day their nutrition and the cost and the、uh, the C by the picture. So those are、uh, uh, something we are, we are doing. So we do the research, we do the experiment. We do the advocacy, and then we implement this, and help government 
to get this uh, circle improvement. Uh, since uh, we successfully conducted this uh, program, uh, we understand earlier intervention is more important. This is uh, Professor uh, Hackman's uh, famous curve. So earlier days intervention uh, have a very good return, uh, better than later. So we do the nutrition intervention for the Yin Yang Bao 2009. That's uh, CDC uh, created with the soybean and the 10 mineral and the vitamin. So now it's become the uh, project covered 832 counties. We do the preschool education 2009. It started uh, in the one, uh, one county, uh, two counties, and now it's uh, uh, have uh, 30 counties. Uh, 200,000 kids uh, get benefit, and the government now make a law and uh, see this is the central government's responsibility. 2015, we do the parenting for the rural area. So we learned that uh, from a uh, Jamaica model and uh, we implement this uh, in China, have a very good result measured by Professor Hackman and uh, uh, with our team. So the results show the children, uh, 80, 4% of them uh, treat, treated uh, children uh, have a higher performance uh, compared with the comparison group. Uh, so that's a very good uh, result. We have totally 10 this kind of the experiment focused on health and uh, uh, education. How could we do that? Uh, we are really deeply small organization Currently, we have uh, six to five uh, staff, including myself. But we have a very good connection with the uh, international organization, academia, media, uh, public corporate, uh, corporation, and the government. So we can work with uh, all of them. For example, our experiment, the money comes from a, a multinational company. Uh, the nutrition program, the money comes from HSBC, Deloitte and uh, uh, another one uh, is Amway. And uh, we got the support from the public. Those, those are important to help us uh, to get, get, get this uh, policy influence. I think I should end it here. Uh, yes, I'm going, we're doing a survey uh, in the 28 policy striking counties. So, Mm, we, we hope in the next uh, five years plan, government next five years plan, uh, we'll have a big uh, components on the children's uh, development, including the nutrition and the education in poverty area. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Lumai, uh, for a, a, a beautifully told story of, of how you can identify uh, innovative approaches and how you can scale it up and how you can build on, on uh, synergistically on other people who want to actually support that issue. Um, I would like next to move to Sejal. Uh, as I mentioned, Sejal is the, uh, Sejal Mystery is the country director for Access Health. Um, based in Singapore, but covering also Southeast Asia. Um, she's going to be talking about uh, COVID uh, and looking at all the innovations that had to come into play in order to actually improve that collaborative work when it comes to responding to COVID uh, across different sectors. And, and then how we can use what we've learned from this process for building a more responsive and a fairer health system in the future. Um, Sejal, I'll hand over the baton to you if you want to go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Askari, and, and thank you to the attendees and, and the fellow panelists. Um, I am with Access Health International, and just by way of introduction to our organization, we are an international nonprofit organization with the vision that all people have the right to high quality, affordable access to healthcare. And what I want to talk about is behind that vision, 
there has to be a system and a foundation in place to make that happen. And I think there is nothing like the COVID-19 pandemic in recent years to really test our health systems um, in all countries, whether it's the lowest income countries or the richest countries. I think we've been tested in a way that we haven't been in, in quite a long time. And last week I had a, a journalist tell me that when he talks to public health professionals and those of us that are in policy and in this sector, he said, I hear a lot about evidence about things that should have been done, the things that could be done, um, but I, I, I wanna talk about action. I wanna hear more about what we can do um, coming out of this epidemic to really respond differently the next time. And I would say respond differently every time. Uh, our strength of our health systems sh should be there for every day, not just for crisis. And I, and I wanna talk about how this pandemic can be the catalyst for meaningful and sustained action. Could I get to the next slide, please? So where are we now and what can we do? Um, this is a tracker from Johns Hopkins University, my alma mater. Um, we're about nearly at 30 million global cases of COVID. And, and again, I, I said I don't want to talk about just numbers and evidence, but it, it is quite stark and revealing to see how uh, COVID-19 is, is a crisis that has really affect the entire world. And we have the surveillance and the technologies to track it in, in considerable detail and understand what it is that we need to do. Um, one thing I, I want to point out, and many of us in this virtual room will know that this pandemic is not a surprise. Um, our lack of preparedness in many instances is also not a surprise. We knew that pandemics were going to be coming. Public health professionals have been warning about this for decades. They've also been warning about some of the challenges that our health systems face. And frankly, the countries that have had invested early on in planning uh, investments and, and preparing really have fared the best. Um, and I want to sort of talk about how COVID-19 is really giving the opportunity uh, for countries to wake up and, and mobilize action. And what I'd like to say is really for sustained action. So. With that, I wanna talk about three actions uh, that we can take from this COVID-19 epidemic. Next slide, please. We can bring healthcare to people and not people to healthcare. This is something that we've been talking about for decades in public health. It's this idea of patient-centric care and, and community-based care. The second point I wanna make is that we can build health systems that lead to higher quality care. Uh, higher quality care, you know, as I mentioned in the vision of Access Health, is, is something that shouldn't be just uh, in the province of wealthier countries or wealthier people. And it's, it's really taking that systems approach that makes it equitable, that can bring that quality across the board. And the last action that we, we have to take uh, and that we can take is that we can put, we can give people affordable access to care that doesn't push them to poverty. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how we're seeing this happen in COVID-19. Uh, next slide. So this idea that we could bring healthcare to people and not people to healthcare, you know, a great example of this is the proliferation of uh, technologies um, like telehealth, teleconsultation, and even the sort of Zoom platform we have today, video conferencing. Now the technologies have actually been around for a while. And what I want to talk about is you need that coupling of technology plus action to really translate into outcomes. What I understood from our colleagues in, in China at Access Health is that there's been a fantastic response from the Chinese government to really play that role of steward and enabler to take those technologies from the private sector and create that regulatory environment an opportunity, particularly in times of crisis, to increase the ability of people to access healthcare in their homes. So not only are they not at risk or reduce the risk to COVID-19, but you're really setting that stage for bringing 
healthcare to people. And the idea, you know, as, as Professor Lou, uh, as Mr. Uh, Lou had mentioned, is that even in these rural areas where people and, and, and their families and their children don't have easy access to healthcare and services, how can we leverage the use of technology to do that? And I hope that COVID-19 in China and many parts of the world, it might have taken crisis for us to move these regulatory policies for teleconsultation and take that action. But it's something that we will see the value over a long term in bringing that access to people. So we see, you know, the policies and and technologies like pinging Good Doctor, where you see a 900% surge in new users and online consultations. Um, I think this will be a very important trend. Um, we've seen also regulatory changes in India, Indonesia. I know in Malaysia, they're also having those discussions throughout the Asia region. There, there really is an opportunity to fulfill this first action. Sec next slide, please. So in building health systems for higher quality care, this is actually something that our, our, our Access Health team in India has been working very closely with the government of India to lay out the standards for a national digital blueprint um, and, and the digital standards and framework for interoperability around healthcare. Again, these are issues that any of us have, that have been in this field have been talking about mHealth, eHealth, national standards for decades now. But it took a crisis like this to put, again, the policy environment, the regulatory environment, and the financial levers in place for national scale adoption, where the uh, innovations around unique user IDs for healthcare, digital doctors, electronic health records, e-pharmacy and telemedicines are well underway in India. And this is something that has been elevated to the level of the prime minister. And I think, again, it's a combination of technology and policy action that will lead to those outcomes. Next slide. And then the third action is, is really around affordable access to care. And, and in this example, I actually am not gonna be talking about action of government, but to emphasize that action can take place within the private sector and civil societies. So here we have two companies, private sector companies in Bangladesh, a Bcash, a mobile digital wallet, and a digital health solutions company that is affiliated with Grameen Phone, uh, one of the major telcos in Bangladesh. They've worked on a number of projects uh, prior to COVID and especially uh, during COVID to bring financial protection to underserved populations so they are able to afford the healthcare that they need. And this is for the indigenous indigenous populations within Bangladesh, but also speaking to the needs of overseas workers and their families where remittances sent back home can be used not only for their own healthcare protection, but for those families back home where you can really create an environment to improve uh, private insurance and, and health insurance. And so what I'd like to emphasize with these three actions is I think COVID-19 has given us a unique opportunity uh, to catalyze action, but that these are actions that can be sustained. Next, next slide, please. When I talk about access, quality, and affordability for, again, for those of us who are in the field, we'll know that these are the very principles around universal health coverage. And this is something that Access Health um, has put out a white paper last year in partnership with Cisco Systems. We wanted to work with the technology sector to really talk about how digital technology can lay that path for achievement for universal health coverage. And here behind everything that I've talked about, COVID-19 really speaks to the greater efforts uh, behind universal health coverage. And in this report, we laid out a 10 point action plan and you will see features of which that I just mentioned in the examples for COVID-19. Uh, these actions are number one, establishing a head of state mandate. It's very important to have the ministries of health involved um, and leading in, in providing the guidance for public health uh, safety, safeguards, and the knowledge. But what a difference head of state leadership makes when you have a president and a prime minister really taking the helm or a national assembly. Uh, that 
that puts that policy, political commitment, and funding behind you know, technology and, and what it can actually achieve. Building a national digital infrastructure, investing in human capital, developing a regulatory and legal framework, appointing an e-health government agency. These again are things that we have been seeing really come to the fore under the COVID-19 epidemic. In particular, as I mentioned in India, these are actions that experts have long recommended, but within this year, now that it is affecting elections and economies, we're getting some real meaningful action on, on these actions uh, that could be used for sustainable uh, uh, achievements towards universal health coverage. Defining an impact measurement framework, leading a multi-sectoral strategy, enabling private sector innovation, adopting a lens of equity, and designing for user experience. Um, I, I wish, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Asghari, we had you know, 20 more minutes, and I know we don't, but I, I really encourage you to think about each of those actions um, and not only the response to the COVID-19 epidemic, but in any health situation, uh, universal health coverage, any health response, childhood nutrition. I think Dr. Liu or Mr. Liu, if you look at these actions, you will see parallels with the actions that you guys have undertaken in, in promoting childhood nutrition and the results and where you see very clear and unequivocal results towards uh, child health and in the increase in their growth as well. Uh, next slide. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, I have a QR code to the report. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you want to learn more about uh, what we are doing to promote the use of digital technology for stronger healthcare systems. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mystery. Um, a wonderful presentation highlighting where we can use occasionally the, the crisis as an opportunity to move forward. Um, examples from India and China, um, you know, you're looking at 2.8 billion people uh, as, as, as ways of using what was in place originally, but actually then building on it and, and using the, 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 the impetus of, of, of economic impetus to, to provide uh, wider services. Um, I'm going to next move to Dr. Mario Villaverde. Uh, Mario is the Under Secretary of Health at the Philippines Department of Health. Um, he is, a, I believe, the person in charge when it comes to implementing the new UHC bill uh, in the Philippines. Um, a, and as with any widespread bill, which is going to have an impact across the board, uh, there are challenges, there are innovative ways that you have to think and you have to overcome some of those. And at this stage, I would like to invite Mario if he could uh, give a talk and presentation uh, highlighting some of those issues and, and some of the, the innovative ways that, that the Philippines is coming forward to overcome some of those. Thank you. Mario, over to you. Thank you, uh, Nima. And uh, greetings from the Philippines to all the participants to this first innovation forum in the Western Pacific uh, region. Um, may I have the slide, please? Yeah, so this afternoon, I will be presenting the reforms and the innovative features of the newly legislated Universal Healthcare Act in the Philippines and uh, the challenges that we face in implementing the law. So the next slide, please. Uh, let me first go back to the evolution of the Philippine Health Service uh, Delivery and financing system. Uh, before 1991, the health service uh, delivery and financing system in the Philippines was highly centralized under the administration of the National Department of Health. At that time, uh, the system was almost entirely dependent on national government subsidies. Also instituted at that time was the Philippine Medical Care Plan which established a social health insurance scheme, but uh, this is limited in coverage only for the employed formal sector. In the 1990s, two major legislation were implemented and this completely changed the landscape of the health service delivery and financing in the Philippines. The first of this law 
is the enactment of the Local Government Code of 1991, which decentralized more powers, responsibilities, and resources, including the devolution of health services from the national government to the local government units. Thus, the once integrated and highly centralized health service delivery and financing system was splintered among the Department of Health and the more than 1,500 local government units in the Philippines where provincial city and municipal governments independently financed and administered their respective devolved health facilities and personnel. Now, the second major reform was the passage of the National Health Insurance Act of 1995 which instituted the National Health Insurance Program under the management of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation or what we call the PhilHealth. This is a government corporation that is attached to the overall supervision of the Department of Health. The law expanded social health insurance coverage to include those in the non-formal sector and the indigents making coverage compulsory for all Filipino citizens. Now, the next slide will show you that despite these two major reforms in the health sector, per capita health spending in the Philippines uh, remained relatively lower than most ASEAN and other middle income countries. The out of pocket expenditure for health remains high this is actually more than 50% of the total health expenditure in the Philippines. And this points to a serious inequity in health financing. Not only is there underinvestment in health, there is also the problem of overlapping and duplicative financing among the different agencies of government and the numerous private entities uh, providing health services. So, the absence of a clear-cut policy on who pays for what contributes to this overlap and duplication, and this leads to inefficiencies in health financing. A review that we have conducted of the health sector performance since 1991 showed that the resulting fragmentation of the health system has hampered performance. This is mainly due to the deepening have priorities attached to health among the thousands of autonomous service providers consisting of local government units and the private entities. Now, the next slide. Uh, to resolve these nagging issues, the Philippines passed the Universal Health Care Act in, in 2019, that was uh, last year. And this is aimed at instituting a healthcare model that will provide access to a comprehensive set of quality and cost-effective services without causing financial hardship. This is uh, particularly to ensure equity and financial risk protection. And also realizing universal healthcare through a systemic approach and clear delineation of roles of key agencies and stakeholders towards better performance in the health system. This is uh, to ensure greater efficiency in our uh, health system. Now, next slide. The universal healthcare law can be viewed as a system of reforms and innovations which when implemented comprehensively serves to integrate service delivery and financing in a devolved setup like the Philippines. These innovations uh, include first, the establishment of healthcare provider network with primary care as its foundation and with apex hospitals as providers of specialized care. This is to ensure the provision of a continuum of healthcare services across different service delivery platforms. The second uh, feature 
is the organization of our fragmented local health systems into province-wide and city-wide health systems through cooperative governance among component local governments in a province or in a highly urbanized city with the provincial and city health boards managing this cooperative undertaking. Another feature is the integrated investment planning, which consists of a, the preparation of a three-year local investment plan for health. Uh, this three-year period coincides with the political term of local government officials and thus harmonizing the entire administration of the medium-term plan for health. Now, the fourth um, reform or areas of innovation is the pooling and managing of all resources at the local level uh, intended for health services through the use of a special mechanism for pooling resources, and this is the special health fund. This will be managed by the provincial and city health boards. Now, the fifth feature is uh, financing health services through a contracting mechanism between the province-wide and city-wide health systems and the Department of Health for population-based health services. And with the PhilHealth or the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation for individual-based uh, health services. I will be elaborating this um, last concept in the next slide. So may I have the next slide, please? Yeah. The universal healthcare law uh, classified health services into two major groups of healthcare packages, namely population-based health services and individual-based health services. Population-based health services are those that are intended to be received by populations or identified groups of people, the outcomes of which contribute generally to the wider public health, safety, and protection. Now, in contrast, health services, whether accessed directly through healthcare facilities or remotely through the use of digital technologies, are classified as individual-based if this can be definitely traced back to one recipient and has limited effect at a population level. So in short, population-based health services are generally what we call the uh, public good nature no? of uh, health packages and individual-based health services are the more personal healthcare uh, services. Now, for population-based health services, the law states that the Department of Health will be the one to finance this and shall contract uh, local government units to the province-wide and city-wide health system to ensure shared responsibilities and accountabilities. On the other hand, individual-based health services shall be financed primarily through the social health insurance scheme with field health entering into service level agreements with service providers, whether these are public or private uh, service providers. So by assigning financing accountabilities for population-based and individual-based health services, the overlaps and duplication in financing that currently exists between the Department of Health and PhilHealth and other entities, financing entities, will be avoided. Now, however, and next slide, in implementing the universal health care law, we are expecting key challenges. The first is the economic and fiscal challenges. The, the efficiency gains from the financing reforms under the UHC law are expected to provide added resources for health. However, it might not be sufficient if the intent of the UHC law is to significantly reduce out-of-pocket payments, which currently constitute more than half of the total health expenditures in the Philippines. Now, 
owing to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Department of Health and PhilHealth saw a substantial part of its resources allocated for pandemic response. A substantial share from the tobacco and alcohol uh, excise tax collections that uh, were earmarked for health may no longer be available uh, as this may have been reallocated to COVID-19 related expenditures. The economic downturn brought about by this pandemic and its consequent reduction in the general and excise, excise tax revenues put at risk the rapid implementation of the universal health care law. The second major challenge is the political factors. While the universal health care law encourages local health systems integration, and this is for economies of scale and efficiency, this begs the question on how far and how deep can the integration of local health systems happen in a devolved setup like the Philippines. Of particular concern is on how feasible it is for cooperative governance among local government units to happen when local chief executives come from rival political parties. The challenge is to put forth compelling arguments why local governments with the devolved set up for health would now have to integrate their local health uh, systems. Now, the third major factor is the social challenges. Access to health service may be affected by social barriers in addition to physical ones. Social barriers include those related to social distance that the poor and marginalized feel when faced with a perceived high status health provider. Also, uh, reaching geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas requires tailoring UHC interventions to fit the difficult physical, economic, and health circumstances of the population living in these areas. The adaptive responses to the COVID-19 situation may require greater use of electronic means of communication and expansion of healthcare provision through digital health services. But instituting appropriate financing mechanisms for such digital health services will be a great challenge since the poor and the less literate may have problems accessing and using such technology. The fourth major challenge is related to governance and organizational factors. The UHC law adopted contracting mechanism by both the Department of Health and PhilHealth to ensure shared responsibilities and accountabilities among members of the health system. Effectiveness of the contracting mechanisms depends highly on the contracting capacities and enforcement mechanisms of both agencies. Meanwhile, on the local, at the local level, the management of the special health fund where we will be pooling all the financial resources for local health system, this will be foreseen as a big governance challenge. This mandate rests on the provincial and city health boards. However, there is a critical need to develop management capacities at the local level, more so on financial accountability for the board to perform this function. Now, in conclusion, the current fragmentation of health system in the Philippines with its overlapping boundaries of mandates among different agencies and um, stakeholders, the vague delineation of roles and responsibilities, and the confusing schemes for financing and service delivery at different levels of governance has resulted in unclear accountabilities among national and local government units and other public and private entities. 
leading to inefficiencies and inequities in the health sector. The universal healthcare law attempts to address the fragmentation of financing and service delivery by introducing a set of reforms and innovations such as promoting the integration of various healthcare providers into networks, defining a range of benefit uh, packages into population-based and individual-based health services, and delineating financial financing mechanisms to support these services. These reforms provide the best opportunity to rationally assign responsibilities and accountabilities among major players and stakeholders in health. This is basically to resolve the major issues related to equity and efficiency in the health system. However, various economic, political, social, and organizational challenges from within and outside of the health sector will have to be addressed. Uh, Mr. Chair, that ends my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for this comprehensive overview of the, the UHC challenges. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to move directly to uh, David Stotter. Uh, for those of you who don't know, David is a professor of policy analysis and public management at the Department of Social and Political Sciences in Bocconi University in Milan. And he's going to talk about uh, evaluating innovations and, and, and innovative ways for actual evaluation itself. David, I'll hand over the baton to you if you could start. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon good over there. Good morning, Espresso here in Italy. Uh, if you could pass over the slides to me, I'll be able to blast through them a little bit faster. Uh, I'm not sure how to control from my end. But really, a tremendous pleasure to join you. And all of our team's work focuses on how to use data and low cost, affordable, innovative ways to figure out what works in global health and how to make things work better, where successes happen, how to replicate them. Um, but what I want to really push you today is why we should not do natural experiments in global health. Global health has a lot of fads, things that come and go uh, in and out, uh, and natural experiments could be one of them. I want to give you six simple reasons why those of you listening today should not do them. And the first one of these, click, trying to click through the next slide I here. think you have control, David. I do have control. I am clicking. Here we go. First reason, ah, there's, there's a delay. That's, this was causing it. Um, right, I think I got it now. Good. First simple reason, you may simply not want to know what happened as a result of your program or intervention. Look, in our everyday lives, we often face many forks in the road uh, where we have to make a critical decision. Who we marry, what we eat for lunch. We might not want to know what would have happened had we chosen the other road to travel down. Um, when I work with politicians, especially, this can happen. They may not want to know what impact their program had. Uh, they may think they already know the answer. I implemented the program. Of course it works well. Why do I need to do an evaluation? But in some cases, politicians do want to know and do care about the answer. Let me give you an example of California's uh, tobacco tax that they introduced in 1988. Um, it was the largest ever increase in tobacco control in California where they bumped up taxes by about 25 cents per package and they use that tax for educational campaigns. And uh, my colleague Stan Glantz really took the lead in analyzing this and what he found is California, when they introduced this policy, began to deviate from the rest of the United States and their heart disease death rates, which is really quite profound. But what was important is later on, this program came under attack. And because they had done the work, they had set up the evaluation, they could see when politicians tried to roll back this law that California's trend also began to weaken. Uh, for them, natural experiments, were a way to know. The second reason you may not want to do these really falls on from that. You may not want to do natural experiments if you have vested interests. And definitely tobacco companies were one of those vested interests. 
uh, we found later, we learned that they were lobbying heavily to cut the National Institute of Health's funding to people like Stan Glantz, people like us who were doing natural experiments, you know, helping to figure out what was working in tobacco control and holding politicians accountable when they tried to attack it, undermine it, and weaken it. Uh, we've seen the same thing happen with many areas around fiscal regulations that apply to chronic diseases. Uh, a, a recent one was natural experiments on do taxes on sugar sweetened beverages work. And in this case, it was the city of Berkeley in California uh, versus Big Soda. And uh, here, uh, a nice natural experiment came into place when Berkeley introduced sugar taxes, but neighboring city, Oakland, didn't. Uh, in this case, the public health authorities wanted to know what happened and in a very low cost way. They, they were able to compare the trends in Berkeley, which benefited from the tax on sugar sweetened beverages, to the residents of Oakland who, who did not. And nothing else changed between these cities. And what they found, very simply, in Berkeley, uh, lo and behold, sugar sweetened beverages went down and people started drinking more water uh, to compensate. Again, if you have a vested interest, this is not the kind of information you want because seeing the success in the real world, live settings, like spread like fire in the US and soon Boulder, Colorado implemented it and other cities in the US saw that if Berkeley could do it, well, we could do it too. Um, the third major reason why you might not want to do a natural experiment um, is simply you don't follow medical advice. Look, uh, I know some people like to go rogue and do it their own way. Uh, I encounter this a lot in countries. It's like, well, the US does it that way, but we're going to do it uh, our way. Uh, and that's okay. But look, at working in health economics, I live between two worlds. And it's rare to get economists and health experts to agree on anything. But when it comes to natural experiments, and it seems like they speak with one voice. Here we've got the UK Treasury saying that uh, this bunch of economists in the UK Treasury saying public health policy and practice should be evaluated as a series of natural experiments. And on the other side, here we have the UK Medical Research Council saying natural experiments are the recommended way to understand the health impact of big population wide policies and other large scale interventions. Um, fourth major reason not to do natural experiments. Um, and you know, this is an important one is look, if you do a natural experiment and you really take a hard look at your lived realities, your real world settings, it can lead to real change. Uh, you know, I, I get really frustrated. There's a lot of hand waving, a lot of talk, a lot of zoom conferences and global health, and that's well and good. But if you don't want things to change, natural experiments might not be the right way. And uh, let me take you back to the past because you can end up with things like broken pump handles like this in the center of London. Uh, this, of course, as many of you will know, was a result of Jon Snow, the, not the Game of Thrones Jon Snow, but uh, Jon Snow, the father of modern epidemiology Jon Snow, who was in the time of cholera using natural experiments to figure out amazingly that polluted water was the source of the epidemic and he took action so if you don't want broken pump handles in your community you don't want real change natural experiments not right for you finally uh i got two others oh, i want to talk about and one is you've got a big budget you like making things complicated and much more costly than uh they need to be uh the nih in the u.s wanted to figure out if people having bigger plates would eat more. And maybe if they could convince people to use smaller plates, they would eat less. They ended up spending over 580 million on randomized controlled trials to try to figure out the answer to this question. And the answer they got was, it depends. Look, frankly, we have a team of graduate students with a little bit of sweat equity and some clever innovative designs were able to figure out this question with the advantage of not doing it in the artificial setting of the lab, but in people's own houses, making the choices in the worlds they actually live in. And that's really the thing about a natural experiment is that it is about design rather than solving problems with fancy statistical magic tricks or big infrastructure and randomized trials. It is an innovative 
design-based way to address some of our most challenging problems. Um, final, final reason not to is like, great, well, you know, well and good natural experiments make a lot of sense, but we, we look, we forgot, you know, we had another government in, now we're coming in, it's too late to look at, to look at what happened. Uh, and uh, you could tell yourself that, but it's not necessarily true. Let me give you an example from uh, Facebook. And uh, if you believe the data, and I'm very much a numbers guy, uh, we spend 38 minutes a day on average on Facebook, which really is, is quite profound if you think about it. just in a short period of time. Uh, I mean, I was alive when uh, Facebook uh, didn't exist, but that, that's a big change in, in, in the way we spend our day. And there's a lot of people who, who wanted to know, is this good or, or bad for our well-being? Terribly difficult question to resolve because now we live in a world where almost everybody's on Facebook. So you don't have a control group. Um, and natural experiments could help solve this problem. And some very clever researchers based out of Israel uh, found that a security company had for security regulations, they were concerned about uh, uh, privacy links with Facebook and their company, um, had some members who for security reasons couldn't be on Facebook as part of the job. So they were for years not on Facebook and others, uh, others were because their security required less clearance. And this gave the opportunity to learn. And uh, what they found is that, uh, I won't really go into details on the graph, but that Facebook use brought those uh, persons who used it, their happiness down by about a standard deviation. A standard deviation is really quite substantial because that's about the effect size we often see from using antidepressants. And what they found, the reason was that people were making social comparisons. They were comparing their lives with those of the people they were watching. And they knew that others uh, were posting carefully manicured, dressed up versions that were not real of their lives, but it still made people feel bad about themselves exposing what they perceived as inadequacies in their own lives. And this really didn't affect, if you look out to the right, older persons, it really was more the young. But what was important here is the natural experiments were done in the past. And they helped answer a very difficult question, one that affects all of our lives. By the way, if you do use Facebook, I recommend don't make social comparisons. So look, our job as data scientists uh, is to take a world that has a great, tremendous, fascinating variety of difference, difference among us, uh, people, race, age, sex, ethnicity, where we live, uh, uh, where we're born, how we, what we choose to eat, and to try to make sense out of this world, to not compare apples and oranges, but to create those kinds of rich treatment, intervention, and control groups from which we can learn. Uh, learn from our successes and failures and, and where we fail to fail better. And, and if, if you find that these reasons not to do natural experiments don't apply to you, uh, then uh, you may want to consider them as a tool. I know uh, Gaudan Galea and, and his team is at, at the forefront of applying them in innovative ways throughout the Asia region. Um, and we've worked with them to develop the first course on natural experiments uh, that was led and, and uh, run by the WHO for uh, the European region. Um, and simply, the difference is, it's design-led research. It uses simple tools. Simple tools, the, the tools that Jon Snow did uh, when he didn't have the medical knowledge we have, uh, and he didn't have the statistical tools that we have, and yet he was still able to stop cholera. These are affordable, and effective and these natural experiments happen uh, happen to us uh, every day and I uh, hope you'll uh, consider joining us to take advantage of them and see how they can help you uh, improve improve your work and, and work to uh, improve uh, the, the health of the public. Thanks so much. Thank you David for that colorful presentations and, and the discussions and uh, use of reverse psychology and behavioral science tools to convince us about natural experimentation. Um, I'm gonna to go to uh, Martin. 
uh, as a discussion to bring a few things over and then we will go to Q&As and, and we are collecting questions and answers at the moment so um, and, and combining them to, to, to give them to the panelists as a whole or individual panelists. But first, Martin, would you like to come in and uh, summarize, identify issues? Thank you. Thank you um, very much, uh, Nima, and um, that was a, a wonderful set of presentations, giving us a, a wide range of different types of innovations and looks at innovations in terms of different elements of delivering health. We saw uh, programs, um, systems, IT and technology, policies and taxations, I think we work on an assumption that most of the people who are in this virtual room at the moment are interested and supportive. And I, the challenge in front of us is to um, think through how we as an organization and as a public health community can engage more proactively. Um, for our region, um, one of the challenges that we face, and we see this in the session title, can success be replicated institutionalizing impact-driven innovation? Um, we have many countries across our region that are facing a challenge to transform their health systems for the needs of the future. Needs for the future that are different to some extent from the past with growing burden of non-communicable diseases, people living longer, uh, climate change, a range of challenges. So transforming health systems is key to what we need to be thinking about. And so therefore, how can innovations be replicated and institutionalized to help those transformations? Now, from the examples that we've heard, um, there's been many, I think, uh, familiar issues raised in terms of use of evidence, of analysis, of engaging policy makers in terms of piloting. Um, I think a lot of tried uh, and uh, tested and important elements in terms of, of how innovations can begin and then be taken forward. Um, there's also been some really interesting things that have come out uh, in terms of uh, challenges and I think that pose important questions for us. The first, I would say, is in the area of rethinking and redesigning, two of the, the taglines for this forum. What are we thinking about in terms of the innovations that we're seeing and how that can feed into rethinking and redesigning the future of healthcare and healthcare delivery in our region. Um, that's a critical question because we, we want to rethink healthcare systems um, and we'd like to explore innovations and how we get the right interplay between those two things. We can't just take the innovations and transform them. We can't just rethink and then look for an innovation. We need to get a, an interplay between those two. The second, and I think this is critical and something that really came out to me from each of those presentations, is then when we think about taking forwards, the importance of people. Um, whether that is people who will take forward innovation, we saw human capital was mentioned in a, a number of those, or whether it's in terms of the vested interests of people or organizations. Um, and clearly that came through very much in the um, health systems, the UHC presentation from the Philippines. But we can see that in many other areas where there are um, many reasons why people may not want to take forward innovations and we need to have a clear understanding of those interests and how to engage. Which brings us, I think, to the question of how can we encourage a system to be an innovating system, one where the leadership from the top of the system would actually encourage and support this uh, on a regular basis so that innovation is not seen as a kind of fancy add-on um, but actually is part of the core of how a system thinks and works and how we can change systems. 
So I think, um, Nima, some very, uh, from different perspectives, very, very insightful and useful presentations, which for me have provoked a lot of thought thinking, firstly on how do we use innovation to help us redesign and rethink transforming healthcare systems across our region? And then secondly, how do we recognize or how do we engage with the people who innovate but the people who may be opposing the innovation to then um, take forward in the future as we, uh, as we look to transform health systems from across our region? Thank you, Nima, back over to you. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I am going to start with a couple of questions. Let me bring in your question, Martin, the second one, if that's okay. And this is open to all of you. Um, uh, how do we manage to influence people who, who are uh, who don't want to be influenced by the innovation, who don't want to uh, 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 acknowledge the, the information. And also part of that as a second and third questions, what I have is, and these are open to all of you, um, a, we have examples given in here from three countries that are very decentralized, uh, Philippines, China, and India, where health is uh, not, a, it, it, it's a, it's a sub-national uh, mandate. So how can we scale up and implement some of these innovations when decision-making is across different geographical locations and or sometimes in hand of different parties when it comes to decision making versus uh, the central party. And, and the third question, um, just to uh, cap put them all together, how do we capture success factors that cannot be captured by data or quantitative studies? And how to transfer that knowledge to other geographies? Um, so those are the first three questions. Um, Unless somebody wants to raise their hand or start talking from the, the, the four panelists, I will ask, um, just go through the, from the beginning to the end, I'll ask um, uh, Lumay to start. Uh, but unless somebody else wants to, to pop in um, and raise their hands in that sense. Um, so if I don't hear anything, uh, can I ask then uh, that uh, if you can start just from the same, same uh, process of starting from uh, Luma, if you have any thoughts or ideas about answering some of those questions. Thank you. Uh, to design the experiment, uh, we need to be problem lead the de designing. So, uh, for example, Professor Amartya Sen said, uh, in India, the problem is also the malnutrition. And uh, they decide, uh, they, they do it by suit in the Supreme Court and uh, have that the law uh, enforcement. That's uh, uh, his uh, approach, very successful. And uh, in China, we cannot go to that way, different uh, system. So we do the experiment. And uh, we take uh, opportunity because the government want to fight with the poverty. So nutrition is very important for the health and also for the uh, to stop the poverty, that's uh, originally. But uh, when you started this uh, experiment, you need to guide it by the theory. We learned from WHO about nutrition and also World Bank. World Bank in 2006 has a, 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 a paper, a book about uh, put the nutrition in the center of the development. So it's emphasized how important it is. So when we started it to come to the next stage, it is important. It is the opportunity uh, to solve it. But uh, uh, could, could we get the result? Someone believe the earlier age, earlier days is important. When they got the uh, school, primary school, uh, middle school, uh, their height cannot change despite the, the nutrition system. But we learned uh, it could be changed, the catch up effect. So we designed a program with a comparison group and we see the result. It's not only the height. The, the, the height is the indicator, is uh, uh, acceptable 
because the imported area, 13 years of boys is just equal to the 10 years of boys in the urban. That's the result cannot accept. So we emphasize this negative side, but also we show the result. What's the government worried about? The central government worried about they spend a billion of money, but no result because the implementation. They believe our leader said if they implement it in the city, easy to monitor. But those remote area, how do you control? Because the principal or teacher could be corrupted to get this money and nobody find it. So we also prove that be, can be uh, monitored and uh, can be improved. And also uh, because the media uh, monitoring uh, those, and uh, if they find any case in the newspaper, in the self media, they, they criticize very strongly. So now the government think, okay, this can be uh, have a good result and uh, the money you spend in this area can win the support and they do. A uh, different uh, area has a different situation. Uh, for example, some area has no uh, egg supply. They need to ship from other place. So the price may be a little bit higher. That's uh, uh, through the, our monitoring system, we compare all those uh, price that they uh, supply and uh, see uh, if they're in the range that's acceptable. All those are uh, in the detail, but uh, those details are important for the implementing the poverty and the one the support from a government bureaucratic system to the uh, public. That's, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, thank you. Sajal, do you have any comments? Yes, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to start my video. Um, I, I want to take the first question that you posed about convincing people who are resistant to change and maybe adopting new innovations. Um, I guess there's two, two aspects I'm looking at. One is convincing leadership and policymakers or corporations, those with vested interests against change. And I think this is where uh, the masses and civil society play a very important role. Then the court of public opinion, if you can convince enough people to do the right thing, uh, those that are in power will have a strong incentive for change. Now, if, if the, the question is really centered around how do you convince a population to change or adopt new innovations or to adopt new habits, sometimes it doesn't have to be even, you know, technological innovation, just simple, something as simple as childhood nutrition. Then again, I think there is a, an effect of um, getting public, raising public awareness and support. And I don't want to, you know, strike the same tune in talking about technology, but I think it's quite remarkable how social media and other platforms of digital technology, maybe more so than public health professionals and public health campaigns, have been important to spread messages, viral messages. Uh, COVID-19 COVID health education, public health innovation. I, again, I hear from my colleagues in China how transformative WeChat has been to push health financing, health systems changes, just to convince people to take up insurance. You know, this is something that people don't want to think about, but if you make it convenient, if you make it easy to understand, if you incorporate in people's day-to-day -day lives and show people why these innovations affect them on a daily basis, I think that change can happen. Um, the other point I want to bring about that is, is the evidence, the convenience, getting the word out there and trust. You know, this is something I see over and over again in health. Evidence matters, but so does trust. People need to know that the, the, the body, the entity, the policy maker or the professional that's, you know, conveying those guidelines are people that really care about them and trust for their well-being. Uh, so, you know, th those are some of the smaller, softer factors, the things that, you know, as you mentioned, that quantitative analysis doesn't pick up, but I think are quite critical in, in uh, setting the stage for 
uh, sustained innovation, replication, um, and change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mario, uh, I noticed that you've raised your hand as well, and, and, and uh, the questions are to you, especially as a policymaker. How do you get convinced uh, in making those decisions? <laughs> Over to you. When it comes to the first um, question on scaling up and implementing innovation across uh, different locations, uh, we have several experiences in the Philippines. Among our local chief executives, these are generally the uh, governors and the city mayors. And um, I can immediately think of three, three areas. No? Uh, this, uh, we introduced the luck by Aral, we call it the luck by Aral. This is basically a study tour for local government um, uh, executive, local chief executive, so that they can visit uh, areas with success stories and with uh, innovations that have been introduced in their local health systems. Now, we also um, instituted the local government scorecard system and this is uh, something similar to the national government through the DOH rating the performance of our local government units in terms of uh, uh, health services and uh, we gather all the governors the local government um, uh, executives in one big forum and uh, give them the report card and this has made some excitement among them because they now compare notes like a, like a, a grade, uh, grade school uh, students. They compare their, their uh, scorecard and they will see because this is a color-coded uh, scorecards where those who are not performing well or indicators that are not performing well are rated red. Those that are performing well are rated green, and those in between are yellow. And uh, with the scorecard system, they are able to appreciate uh, where they are in terms of performance, and they can compare notes. Of course, the third major areas that we introduce is documenting success stories and good practices, and uh, also documenting the unsuccessful programs and projects. Now, this. All of these have been affected by the COVID-19 when travel, uh, workshops, meetings have been very limited, almost nil. And so I think we really need to develop in the health sector the use of digital technology, especially in a country like the Philippines where we have uh, remote islands and uh, um, uh, very difficult to reach uh, mountainous areas. No? So this is really a, 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 a very important aspect to develop in the health system, the digital technology. Thank yeah. you. Um, um, it's, 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 um, I'm smiling because many decades ago when I was working in Cambodia, we tried to do something similar when it comes to infection prevention and control in the hospitals by creating a scoring card and giving a prize to the hospitals who were performing best against themselves. So it wasn't about saying that you're a rich hospital, therefore you're going to have a better IPC. It was actually how, how, how much you've improved yourself to try and actually influence them to move in the right way. Um, I'm going to come to David. David, any comments, any thoughts from those questions or any other additional questions that you might have? Uh, we have roughly five minutes or so left. Uh, so I don't think we'll be able to go over to the next slide because we need to look at the summary of the, of the thing as well. Over to you, sir. Just, uh, I've been answering questions in the Q&A panel, that, yeah. so for those of you uh, with us, keep them coming. But let me take this one from Xin Jinping. Is it not possible that people don't do natural experiments because they don't know about them or they don't know how? And that's a really good question because uh, natural experiments are as old as John Snow in the time of, of cholera, and they're hugely relevant today to coronavirus. Our, our team's trying to apply them to figure out which lockdown measures have worked, uh, worked well, which haven't, um, just like John Snow did. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a different way of thinking that's not commonly taught uh, in graduate school programs. It's starting to be, but 
that then has a lag how it's carried over. Uh, what we found is that just about that just about anybody can do it, and they're quite intuitive. Uh, again, with Gaudan Galea, we took uh, the statisticians as well as health practitioners who worked in health ministries from Turkey, uh, Finland, uh, across the European region, trained them up. And within six months, they had all published in peer-reviewed journals their evaluations of their own uh, chronic disease control programs in their countries. Happy to share that series with you. Um, but again, it, it was a very low cost initiative and built a capacity that endures. And those countries are now leading the way in uh, putting out natural experiments and producing some of the best evidence we have on uh, the effectiveness of public health policies. So it is possible they don't know how, but it, it's something that uh, can be addressed and we're really trying to help build capacity in that area. So if you are interested, uh, do get in, in touch with us. And I think from the speakers, we've heard some really great examples uh, from uh, Dr. Mai, uh, and per, together with Professor Heckman, they did an excellent example of implementing a very pragmatic experimental approach. Those are successes that, as we've heard, can really help amplify our advocacy because we're armed with the evidence. That's our ammunition that, you know, it was really inspiring to hear Dr. Mai about how he was able to you know, bang on to the government and say, no, we can do this, we can do this, we've got the evidence, and uh, break down those barriers. I'm really inspired by that story. Um, um, thank you. But let me, let me follow up on that. How long do we need to wait if we want to do these, these, these innovations? before we can convince how long is the time horizon when it comes to social development programs before we can do that. I mean, uh, Lumai mentioned that, you know, uh, it took roughly four or five years from 2010 to 20, 2012 to 2016 to show that five centimeter increase in growth. Uh, but if there is no quantitative data, yeah. how long are we so, gonna work? And this is open to so, everybody. Exactly, I mean, this was a big problem in, uh, as I was answering to one of the commentators, in tobacco. Right? Politicians want to see outcomes, but sometimes those outcomes can have a lag. But look, in epidemiology, we work with causal chains, and we know that some things can happen rapidly and some things come with a, a lag. So in the case of uh, tobacco, we learned heart attacks could change quite rapidly when we put in place bans in public spaces. Um, but cancer, of course, would take several decades. And if we want to see the success or failure, well, we know that a ban is going to have benefits. We can look even earlier and see how many people are benefiting from smoke-free environments. We can come up with implementation outcome measures that are earlier that also help give us guidance on are, are things going the way that, that we planned. So there is a challenge in, in finding those early indicators of success, but almost all programs have them if we look carefully, and I, Dr. Maya, I, I, I realize that the ultimate payoff, of course, is those nutrition gains, but those take times. But if you looked earlier, there's some, er, probably would be some early signs that things were on the right track to deliver those nutrition gains uh, that, that you, you so hopefully found later. Thank you. Mario, I'm gonna ask the same thing. I'm gonna wrap up soon, but the same question to you. You know, you're talking about the number of innovations that you want to bring on as part of the new UHC law across a whole host of areas from service delivery to financing to individual and public health. Uh, how long do you have to show that these innovations work before the Senate is gonna come and say that, well, we need to look at this again? Do you have a timeline? Are you under pressure? Over. It was to Maria. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, the the universal healthcare law in the Philippines uh, gave us some uh, timeline on how we will introduce this innovation that were uh, provided in the law, and the transition period is six years, and uh, this is a very difficult one because um, we need to to do a lot of you know uh, convincing the political structure at the local government units because we have to deal with more than a thousand uh, municipalities and provinces and this is the most difficult part and this has become very very crucial 
in terms of the response to COVID. Now we see the weakness of a very decentralized health system. In a pandemic like this and in major calamities or epidemics, you need some form of command and control structure. And yet in the Philippines, we are very fragmented and you have to discuss. And this is also the reason why uh, different local government units have issued guidelines that are not following the national guidelines. And so people uh, moving from or traveling from one local government units to another will be subjected to different procedures in terms of the prevention and control for COVID. No? Uh, one, one LGU uh, local government unit will require this kind of testing. Another one will require this testing and not following the... So this is really a very crucial uh, decision. And there is now a clamor actually for the, uh, from some sector that we probably should renationalize our decentralized health system because it cannot survive a pandemic uh, like this you know, without a command and control uh, management team. Thank you, Mario. I, I, I think you're very brave to come and say that you want to renationalize the health in the Philippines in a public forum like this. Um, uh, Shachal, do you have any comments quickly? And then I'll move to Lumai, and then we can do the summary and, and, and say goodbye to everybody. So, Shachal, to you. Yeah, just to, I guess one final comment from me is I, I really want to echo some of the comments that David made in terms of finding those early indicators of success. I think for anything that requires long-term change and investment, we see this also in the areas of digital technology. If you're waiting for an ROI of 10 years, 15 years, because sometimes that's the average it takes, there are almost undoubtedly be benefits that start accumulating very early on, within six months, within a year. And I think identifying those, communicating those are really important to affect those long-term changes. And again, the, the other point I want to make is I remember many years ago when I was at the National Institutes of Health uh, in the US, uh, Francis Collins, who heads up the NIH, had talked about a 14 year lag between evidence and clinical practice when it came to scientific research. That's a 14 year lag. And this was the reason why implementation research from uh, bench side to bedside came about. And I think also the same for public health. We need to start doing the same where we have implementation research really built into the rollout of our different programs. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Lumai, final word. Um, I know you had some comments to make. Over. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, we need a comprehensive uh, program for the child development in the poverty area. Well, we learned that uh, also from a uh, different uh, institution. We need to care about those uh, children uh, from a pregnant woman to the job market. So we call this from womb to the job. And uh, now we work uh, with uh, uh, WHO Beijing office on the breastfeeding. So I think that's a starting uh, project that we, we have. A second, about those uh, experiments, uh, we need to learn more from other countries' experience, like uh, India, they, you, you have uh, uh, the village center for child development. Now we pro, uh, suggest the uh, government with a project like uh, one village, one preschool, like a uh, pirating, but put it together in the village to provide a public service for the next five years plan. Third, exchange uh, the information and the uh, uh, experience uh, is important. So we are a member of Asia Pacific Regional Network for Earlier Childhood. Uh, that's a nonprofit organization with uh, 15 countries and uh, uh, 2,000 members. So we share the information together. That's uh, uh, non-profit organization will enjoy uh, to work with them. 
that's uh, what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to finish by putting up the graphic that our graphic artists have been uh, working on based on the presentations. I know some of you all wanted to see what, what it looks like. So uh, this is basically summarizing the day. Um, I just need to expand this so I can see it properly myself. And as we said, we started with, uh, with the speech, with the presentations on uh, the equity and the nutrition in the rural areas. Uh, the importance of school meals, safeguarding children's future, and showing uh, that actually there was a mental and physical improvement in, in, in the development uh, stages for these children. Uh, and then we looked at uh, Ms. Mystery's uh, presentations about meaningful actions and sustained uh, action. A, and using it a crisis as an opportunity to move forward, giving examples of uh, bringing the healthcare to people, uh, building on the on the health systems that were in different stages, and actually working on that and improve the quality of care, and then give people affordable access uh, with examples from uh, Bangladesh, India, and China. Uh, we then moved to the innovations in the Philippines across those four or five areas, establishment of the healthcare provider network, uh, organization of local health systems into province-wide and city-wide boards, the integration of uh, local investment planning for health, uh, pooling and managing of all uh, resources for health, and then contracting mechanism. And then we came to David's uh, a presentation, which was about natural uh, experimentations and things why people don't may not want to do it and why it's important to actually to, to push for it there are those six main areas that was uh, a, 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 which were covered together um, um, you know we don't need to uh, we want to know what's happened we want to tackle the vested interest. We want to uh, follow the medical advice sometimes. As a doctor, I can say that. Um, um, a, we want to uh, look at uh, a, the ways of changing, um, making things, you know, we don't need to make things complicated. And, and, and it's never too late to do that and actually use our rich data that we have uh, to use that. Um, uh, for making these innovations um, um, impact driven and, and work. Uh, I have a, a request. Uh, Gordon, would you like to say the, the, a couple of words to the end or would you like me to finish? I know time is no, no, um, no, pressing, you, but. You've summarized this very well. Over to you, Nima, you take control. Thank you. So with that, I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, I want to thank Martin, who, who summarized much more eloquently than I did uh, the, 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 the cross-cutting issues. Um, I want to thank the behind-the-scenes team, led by Gordon and, and uh, Menji and, and Vlad, who were working on it. And of course, I want to thank our uh, uh, graphic artists and illustrators who brought everything together. Um, I believe the next session is going to be a tomorrow morning for those who are interested uh, at 10 o'clock Manila time and then the closing plenary for the forum is at 1 p.m. Manila time and I hope to see some of you if not all of you during that. Uh, with that, thank you again for your time, your thoughts, your wisdom uh, and for sharing that with everybody. And a goodbye from me.